Okay. Oh, hope this is better. Should be. Aloha. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm executive director of the Hawaii Book of Music Festival. And it's my pleasure to welcome att attendees and this terrific group of poets, writers, artists, um, from uh, practicing Okinawan arts under the leadership of Lee Tonucci, uh, the famous Lee Tonucci. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Lee and thank you again for participating. Thank you, Roger, for having us. How's it? And hi, Sai. I'm Lee Tonouchi. Uh, welcome to our sneak preview of Chiburu, Anthology of Hawaii Okinawan Literature. And this book was made possible by one generous grant from Hui O Lao Lima. It's the coming out from Best Press in early 2023. For the super excited people, it's available now for pre order. From the Best Press website. Yeah, just go to bestpress.com, yeah, B E S S P R E S S.com and search up Chiburu. So we get so many awesome contributors, bro, for this book. We get Daniel Akiyama, Reb Allen, Laurie Arakaki, Deborah Kang Dean, Shani Gima, Go Dog, Chance Busukuma, Jeff Higa, Daichi and Yoko Hirata, Philip Ige, Brandon Ng, Masahide Ishihara, Kemi Johnson, Grant Kagimoto. Erica Kunihisa, Grant Murata, Ashley Nakanishi, Kavika Napoleon, Don Oshiro, Janine Oshiro, Pianta, John Shirota, Delena Thomas, Lee, Tono Uchi, Nikki Wechi, David Uidoi, Wesley Uenten, Kwan Shin Kabudan, that's Norman Kaneshiro and Eric Wada, Misty Uehara, Aiko Yamashiro, our gorgeous cover art stay by Candice Soon. It's based on one photo by Gordon Uehara and Scotty Moriyama from their Ryukyu Wave Rider series. If you never see our awesome cover yet, I'm just gonna move my head a little bit. Oh, there it is, the cover, all right. So uh, when I was telling my friends the title for this book, I was putting out, yeah, almost everybody would ask me, Lee, Chiburu, what that? Yeah, someone girl and ask, oh, is it similar to when you get excited and you yell, Chihu? I go, uh, no, good try, but good try. So I suppose this lack of knowings is because Chiburu is one really old school Hawaii Creole term that's you know not really used so much nowadays, right? It's definitely not as well known as the terms for used to identify other ethnic groups, right? Like Pake, Buk, Burahead, Yobo, Sole, Pocho, Borinki, Haoli, Popolo, Kanak, etc. It's funny that uh, so many younger local Okinawans was puzzled, right, when they heard Chibulu. Uh, so I had to tell them, Chibulu, that's you. <laughs> So according to the Okinawan English workbook that's put together by Mitsugu Sakihara, in Okinawa, Chiburu is Uchinaguchi. That's the Okinawan language referring to the head or a bottle gourd, a calabash. In Hawaii, somehow the meaning went changed and Chiburu came one pigeon word for denote uh, persons of Okinawan ancestry. Yeah, so does it have a positive connotation or does it have a negative connotation? Yeah, we know more time to discuss all that today but I go over all of that inside the book. Uh, I, got, I even got one uh, cool oral history from Masandu Sensei. So he dropped some knowledge on top of this topic. It's very interesting, you know, uh, so be sure to forget the book when it comes out early 2023. So for today's sneak preview, our, our lineup is we get five readers. So I'm gonna be the opening act. Then we're gonna get awesome Ashley Nakanishi. Say hi, Ashley. Yeah, we're gonna have the incredible Jeff Higa. <laughs> All right, Jeff. The wonderific Janine Oshiro. What happened to Janine? Oh, she disappeared. Oh, there she is in the middle. I never see her there in the middle. And then we're gonna close with the musical stylings of the bad boy himself, Brandon Ufugusuku Ng. All right, Brandon. So I'm Lee Tanuchi. I put together this collection. Yeah, I'm an Okinawan Yonsei known for writing in Hawaii Creole. My poetry collection. Uh, significant moments in the life of Oriental father and son. Uh, Dawan Wan won, uh, 2013 Association for Asian American Studies Book Award. I won a 2017 Po'okela Award for my script, Uchinaloha, 
that premiered at Kumakuhua Theater, and then my children's picture book, uh, Okinawan Princess. Oh, can I see the picture? Okinawan Princess, The Legend of Hajichi Tattoos, huh? Don won one uh, 2020 Skipping Stones Honor Award. Uh, for that one, my artist was Laura Kina, and we even had Okinawan translations by Masaki Sakihara. Um, most recently, I'm the recipient of the 2021-2022 Tony Quagliano Poetry Award. Okay, small key time. I associated everything Okinawan with the old people, right? Because they was the only ones I seen doing Okinawan things, right? My grandma played Sanshin, uh, she played Koto, she did Okinawan dance, she did everything. Uh, she passed away now, but I remember when my first book came out, we had the reading at UH Campus Center and she wanted to make Andagi. I told her, ah, no need, Grandma. Marriott going cater. Plus, going to get like 300 people there. Ah, but she insisted, right? It was important to her, you know, that the book launch party get Andagi. Because to her, one party is not one party, right? If no more Andagi. <laughs> so this poem goes out to my grandma, right? It's called, She Becomes the Andagi Nazi. People always say my grandma makes the best on the ghee. Usually my grandma a nice lady, but I don't know who she is when I bring home on the ghee from someplace else. Cause she always gotta get something for say. And it's not, thank you. This one, no naf cook, oil gotta be hot, you know. I come so small, or send grip. Oh, funny kind of color. This no egg yolk, food coloring must be. Andagi gotta be round. What shape this? Ah, oh, too much one time they fry. As why come koge? Oh, how much they sell this kind? Oh, no buy next time. No more the taste. Where this from? Health food store. People always say my grandma makes the best andagi. And my grandma thinks so too. So my grandma used to tell me Okinawans and Japanese is different, right? She said that before time, Japanese never liked Okinawans, but I never know that history when I was small. And she told me that, you know, um, uh, she, all she told me was Okinawans more country, that's why. She did say that one time when Japanese girl caught her one monkey, um, flash forward to when I'm old now, I'm doing my own research, I found out, I find out all kinds of shocking things now. It was bad enough that my grandma was called one monkey, but I found out that before time in Japan, Okinawans was literally yeah, monkeys in the zoo. So. I wrote one poem about the Jinru Kai, that's the Native People Exhibition. So I first read about this um, from scholar Wesley Uenten in his essay, Okinawans on Mainland Japan, Discrimination, Imagery, and Identity. He tells, we can link the image of Okinawa being exotic and different to the idea that Okinawans were inferior. One of the most deplorable examples of this was the Jinru Khan, the Native People Exhibition at the fifth Osaka Industrial Exposition in 1903. For this exhibition, exhibition organizers put Ainu, Taiwanese, Aborigine, Korean, and Okinawan women on display for Japanese to gawk at their primitiveness. So, oh, shock I heard about that. So for me, a lot of times, the only way I know how to cope is through humor, yeah? So after I read that, I felt like I have to write one poem about how, how the Okinawan women got to be yeah, part of this horrific thing. So I wondered if the Okinawan women was just taken or if they had to apply for the job. That's a, this is the poem I wrote. It's called, Imagine 1903 Okinawan Help Wanted Ad. Coming soon, Jin Rui Khan. Wanted, performance artist for interactive captivity exhibit. Okinawan females with primitive tattoos needed. Excessive facial and body hair preferred. Must like working with people in close confinement. Competitive wages, we will match any pay if given to Korean Ainu or Taiwanese Aborigine entertainers. Meals will be provided. Must be able to catch food that is thrown. Looking for job security? Why not live, work, play in a cage? All right. Yeah, so that was quite shocking. Okay, we're gonna move on now. Our next reader is Ashley Nakanishi. She's one local educator, artist, and author. When she's not working with at-risk youth, you can catch her at her small ranch, fostering injured animals, working on her garden, 
and playing in playing a part in the world of magic created by her children. Oh, today she <laughs> share, <laughs> today she could share one of the poems she get in our upcoming anthology Chiburu book. So take it away, Ashley. Hi, Tai. Uh, this book is going to be uh, this poem is called Kokusai Dori, an exploration of politics and diaspora in Okinawa. All right, let's get into it. My grandmother woke up every day at the same time, prayed at the same altar, went about her same business for over 60 years. She watched buildings rise and fall and nations fall in the streets of Kokusai Dori. As a child, I watched her hands dance in the wind as they traced the walls, the ruins of Luchu Kingdom. She would detail whole histories during our walks as she talked of magic and the power of food, the way it healed the wounds of war and famine. I watched her body stand tall like warrior as we walked through New Village, a militarized weapon of dependence, glowing white like the smile of a Western sun. Banners looked like fireworks shooting across glass, the women, ivory mannequins. The ambrosia of McDonald's wet the air like rain, golden arches like arms trying to pull me in. I tugged at Kachan's pant leg, a child's resistance as she dragged my young body forward. Countless generations of bodies she had to carry through these streets. When only a child of 14, she was forced to cower under bodies of friends, family, and neighbors to mask her heartbeat. Then later, she hauled them to the sides of the road so that they wouldn't be run over by, mili by American military vehicles, a final attempt to save what was left of them. Returning back to the caves to help set bones, she pressed on the Diego flowers to make the medicine their anma taught them. She picked and healed wounds with the same tools they used to pick food apart. Today, the streets roar with sounds of horns and yelling between foreigners, gaijin. They pour in like buckets of fish across the choppy waves of traffic. And today, we cross the streets toward Old Village. Kachan's body became a willow tree gently swaying to a melancholy melody as she points with her crooked finger and tells me this is where your ancestors stayed. Then goes back to humming folk songs and a sing-songy voice and says, we get ready for Oban today. I didn't know what that really means, except that we get to hear Taiko and Asa all night long, watch the Chondara dancers, throw their air, throw their hands and fans up in song as we burn money at altars, spending over 10,000 yen on cantaloupe and plums, watermelon and grapes, noodles and meat. She points out to me the oldest bento shop, says that during the war she hid there. It's the only shop that ever got up from its knees. This is the real Okinawa, she explains. And I'm only now beginning to see what she means. Farmers, fishermen, streamsters, merchants all gather like an old world exchange, reclaiming their culture here. Here, they rebelled against the state, unafraid of their language, unashamed of their diet, unadulterated by today's trend. This is real Okinawa unlike all the things I knew to be. Thank you. Yay. Okay, so Ashley, I have some questions for you. Hi. Okay, so um, whenever we talk story, you always want to talk about your grandma. And then she says- Yeah, I know, I talk about her all the time, yeah. <laughs> she figures very prominently every time. Huh? So you can try, tell us about your grandma, like your real grandma. Oh, so uh, my grandmother told me uh, Nakanishi. She is from Shuri village, uh, relocated to Miyagi village after uh, she married my grandfather. They actually met in uh, World War II during the Battle of Okinawa. 
um, he was a wounded, he was wounded, yeah? He was also the only survivor of his family. So after the war, they got back, they got together and uh, had lots of kids, you know, lots of kind things, yeah? But she just was always this kind of pillar of strength that we looked up to. Uh, even though despite everything, she always chose to survive. She always chose to press forward and be there, you know, where she could for her children. Um, I think the war really affected her. Yeah, she was only 14 years old when the war started. Um, she went to an all girls school and uh, they, they had the girls in turn, yeah, come in and with no knowledge of how to do it, uh, inside these really dark caves, yeah, trying to heal people's wounds with just folk remedies, you know. She's like, whenever we were hearing about it, that it was not like traditional medicine, yeah. And there was these horrifying stories that she would talk about with like when they eat, yeah, like the same stuff, they pick the maggots and like the, you know, the kind of infections out, they dig them out, yeah. They clean them and they use the same ones to eat, you know, it was just, some of that trauma, it becomes generational, I think, yeah. You know, cause all Okinawan, you know, you hear you meet any Okinawan auntie or whatever, like they never like you waste food, but they gonna feed you plenty until you can no longer eat, yeah. So so it was always a, uh, but she was so quiet too, yeah. Um, very interesting woman. Um, she ended up becoming raised by our great aunt. She who's is the one I told you about with the Hajiji Ali. Uh, so she's actually still in Okinawa. Uh, my mom is there now. I was hoping she could chime in and that you guys would be able to meet, yeah? So, <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, my grandmother's story is not unlike many others that lived in Okinawa at that time and watched many of their family died. Uh, you know, our my grandfather was a sole survivor on his side. My grandmother was only one of three, yeah? Of the entire family, yeah? So she just said the things that they had to watch was just crazy, you know? But if you met her before she passed away, you wouldn't know because she would have a beer in one hand and a cigarette in another, talking story, cooking food. Yeah, so it's really, uh, it was a humbling and blessed experience to have someone like my grandmother uh, and be so heavily influenced by her. So, uh, so when you were young, she willingly shared these horrific stories with you like when you are a kid or you had to pry them out of her? I had to pry them. Like one old pee shell, bruh. Like it was, they, she never willingly offered. In fact, she didn't talk about it much until uh, she got dementia in her 80s, yeah? And uh, she would just remember. So sometimes she would just kind of talk, you know, just talk, talk, talk. And then you hear it and you hear these stories and it was just the things, you know, because when you saw my grandmother, she was such a funny woman, you know? She always smiled, always, you know, like, talking, you know, talking stink about people, but you know, kind of the kind, but just this warm, lovely human being. And she was a pillar in her community, had a little bento shop after the war, all kinds of stuff, yeah. But it, to hear some of those stories as she was getting older and before she passed, where I think it helped heal a lot of the family wounds, you know, because when you were raised by somebody who survived war and they internalized that trauma and you know, like the little things, yeah, like what you wouldn't notice before become like, you know, like my grandfather, anytime they wasted rice, yeah, he'd slap them with chopsticks, right? Like tsh, across their hands, you know what I mean? Like it's the little things that, you know, it becomes internalized and then, you know, you start thinking more and more about it. But as generations go by, we see it like, oh my God, you guys survived this horrible thing and we're forced to survive in awful conditions. You know, only for everything to be ripped away from you when you try to return to them. Like my grandmother, her last plight was to find the family bones. She was very convinced to find them. My my grandfather, my uh, Tolchan, that's he said uh, he used to tell my my mother and them, yeah, his kids, that in our tomb, you know, in Okinawa, we have a family tomb over in Naha, <coughs> and it's only sand because he couldn't find all the bones, yeah? So his, his farm, our family's farm, which is now under Camp Kadena, yeah? Um, is, was all wiped out, yeah? Completely wiped out, completely demolished. And like, you know, he had siblings, you know what I mean? And to not find any of their bones, yeah? So that was like our family's biggest and most recent latest plight has been 
uh, trying to restore the integrity of our family line and ancestry and culture and preserve that for our future generations. Oh my goodness. All right. So that battle is still going on. Then. That battle is still present today. Actually, the Ukwan Shin covered, they covered this extremely well. Um, they've had several series and discussions on the topic, but I had no idea that this was such a, a wide, like a, a widely experienced thing. I, I didn't know. I just thought that, you know, like, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, like war, there's devastation. I didn't realize that maybe more than half of the people in that area suffer the same way. And that's, and especially for our roots where the bones are important for our families to hold on to. Yeah. Like it's just uh, one of those things that as she got later in age, she became more and more politically active, you know? So it was, it, it was really important. So how the, it's how I created my last book, The Last Sakura was because she just wanted our future generations to understand Okinawa and understand our, our mythology, our culture, our language and not be ashamed. Yeah. It, no, no. Plenty of stuff. For one other time, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Oh, boy. Thank All you right. for having me. Sorry for the dark stuff, yeah. I was, I was trying to keep them pleasantly. <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that we need to share. We need to talk about, right? Because uh, a lot yeah. of younger people might not know all, all this history, right? Because I didn't know all this history when I was young. All right. Our next reader, Jeffrey Higa. He's the author of Calabash Stories. He's the great grandson of Okinawan immigrants who came to Hawaii to work on the sugar plantations and inherited their stories and love of their adopted land. As a fiction writer, essayist, and playwright, his stories have appeared in Jijava, the Homer Review, Sonora Review, Bamboo Ridge, the Lit Quarterly, Poets and Writers, and others. In 2003, his full-length play, Footless, won first place in the Kumukuhua Hawaii Prize Contest, and his holiday story, Christmas Stories has been serialized on Hawaii Pacific Radio. Today, he's going to share uh, part of his short story in our anthology. Take it away, Jeff. Okay. So, yeah, uh, this this story is kind of a new story because Lee said, hey, write about your family's restaurant. <laughs> so I uh, couldn't say no, yeah. So uh, my great-grandfather, my grandfather owned the Palama Inn uh, in Kalihi. So uh, this is kind of story. This is a story based around that. And um, it's about the, I'm, I'm reading from the middle of the story, the first meeting between the narrator and the story's uh, namesake. And the story is called uh, Kumacha. So, oh, and uh, the, the grandfather in the story went back to Okinawa because uh, some local brothers keep breaking into his restaurant, stealing his knives. So he went to Okinawa, get some more sashimi, sashimi knives, come back. And he brought this big wooden crate. It was a wooden box about double the size of a military footlocker with a row of half dollar size holes along the perimeter. The box was restless. It seemed to rock a little toward us, then left to right, as if anxious to open itself. In the stillness of that moment, we stared at the crate, and I thought I could hear a heavy but measured breathing emanating from the holes. I suddenly remembered all the Japanese movies I had seen that began with a demon being unleashed from the same kind of box. Grandpa slid back the top and a melange of odors, a thick earthiness, like newly upturned soil of a forgotten fallow, combined with the pungent aroma of urine, capped by an astringency of turpentine, rolled us over like a wave. We instinctively held our breath while a pure white dog's head rose slowly from within the box and turned to peer at us over the edge. The solid and weighty head swiveled slowly and smoothly like a white marble statue come to life as it took all of us in. The only signs of color was a darkness near the eyes, like hell's own eyeliner to accentuate the blackness of the pupils, which reflected no light. It rotated its head back again where it paused and held its glare on me. I thought I could hear a low rumbling, like the warning of an angry beehive. This gonna be our new security guard, Grandpa explained as he unlatched the side of the crate. It fell away to reveal an all white Akita whose muscular flanks heaved and then flexed in a kind of lunge 
that straightened his legs and raised his height so that it could almost look me directly in the eyes. This boy named Shiro Kuma, Grandpa explained as he slipped a loose leash around its neck. At the mention of its name, the dog took a few steps forward to position itself in a protective posture next to Grandpa, and I noticed opposing me. Try come meet him. Of course, this white bear from Japan was an apt name for a beast whose broad white head, immovable torso, and ponderous paws brought to mind ursus rather than canine. It is still the largest Akita I had ever seen, a kind of genetic oddity that bubbles up from the genetic drift from unscrupulous breeders from time to time. Rather than having them called for deviating from the breed standard, these anomalies get sold in the underground economy for the cost of feed. Ah, Kuma-chan, said Grandma, affectionately rubbing her small hand over his skull. Big boy, ne? But cute, ne? Kim-san then came over to pet the dog's head, which Kuma-chan seemed to tolerate rather than enjoy. Deciding to be a little different, I thought I would stroke the side of the dog's face, a move I had seen other dogs lean to out of enjoyment. But in my nervousness, I must have inadvertently stuck my finger in Kumachan's eye, because the next thing I knew, there was a crotch punch from his snout, like a baseball in the alas, and I crumpled down. Kumachan then stepped over me, the black outline of his lips pulled back, exposing my face to a double set of gleaming, efficient, and deadly looking came nines. Baka, what you doing? said Grandpa as he yanked the dog from over me. I went save him from the kind of fighting dog ring, so no go provoke him. I never, I said. I was trying. He's your cure die, said Grandma. Grandpa nodded. You have to treat him like my little brother. Yeah, that's all for today. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And so for here, the, uh, the conclusion, you need to buy the book later. Good job, Jeff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. for real. So, Jeff, my question yeah. is for you. How come you think so many Okinawan families own restaurants? What's up with that? Oh, we all like to eat too much. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I, well, I don't know. I know my, my grandfather, um, you know, he came for plantation work, uh, born on the plantation. But he one leg was shorter than the other, so he wasn't really suited for plantation work so he had to find another trade and so he had to go off the plantation and get his training you know working in kitchens starting his dishwasher stuff like that so i think there was that you know they trained each other kind and mm-hmm. then he could open up his own place and oh okay interesting yeah so did did all all the cooking skills get passed down to you jeff see that's the thing he like there's no recipes he didn't have recipes <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, he uh, he could make really good pork adobo because in Kalihi, when the uh, Filipinos started moving into that area, you know, he changed his menu a little bit, right? So he made really good pork adobo, oh, really good, uh, what do you call that? Uh, the, the taco miso kind, really good. Oh, he knew how to cut fish, sashimi, but he never taught any of us. <laughs> and uh-huh. then... And he, he never, it was never like a, a something that, you know, it's just something like he did, you know, it's just something that they did every day. And it was kind of like just a normal part of life. So, yeah. Interesting. Um, I know you used to work at the plantation village. Yeah? So, um, yeah. Knowing history and all that uh, is important to you. So yeah. did you ever do like an oral history with him? Uh, he, he, he died. Um, I never did an oral history with him so much as, uh, you know, I guess through my father, you know, who, who kept remembered some of the stories. So through them uh, is mostly how we learned or through uh, other people from, I guess, his village, Tomari. So, okay. Yeah. I have, they were kind of like, the, the kind of higas who never talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have one last question. Uh, yeah. When do you feel most Okinawan? Oh, well, I was thinking about this the other day. You know, I'm like, <laughs> um, I was talking to some, uh, an Ige in Manoa, and we were complaining because, you know, when you get really hairy arms, 
and the bugs fly, fly nearby, you always know first because they come by your arm and then you go, oh, get bugs over here. And everybody's like, what? I don't feel anything. And then you look because your arm's so hairy. So you know. <laughs> so early bug detection system. Yeah, early, yeah, must be, right? So is it a shield too then? Like, did I protect you from getting bitten? I, I don't know. I still get bits in plenty. But <laughs> uh, all right. I know to, to run away first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Okay. All right. The next person, Janine Oshiro. She's a massage therapist and writer. What a combination. She's the author of Peer, the winner of the 2010 Kundiman Poetry Prize, published by Alice James Books. She has been awarded the 2011 Elliot Cades Awards for Literature in Hawaii for Emerging Writer and the 2013 Asian American Literary Award for Poetry. During the pandemic, she explored storytelling for the first time and was featured in the SCEP Live Online Fall International Storyteller Series. Today, Janine will be sharing the poems to get inside the book. In case you're just joining us, the collection stay coming out early 2023, but it's already available for pre-order at bestpress.com. Search Chiburu. So take it away, Janine. Thanks so much, Lee. And it's so great to be here with Lee and Ashley and Jeff and Brandon. And thanks so much to Roger and all the tech work that has to happen behind the scenes uh, by Colin. So thanks so much. Great to be here. I've always loved the Okinawan song, Tinsagu Nuhana. It's a song about filial piety and the lessons we learn from our parents. But the lessons we learn from our parents are super complicated, right? <laughs> what do we hold on to and what do we need to let go? What are the things that made sense to the children we once were that we now need to reconsider. The poem I'm going to share with you today uses imagery from Tinsagu Nuhana to explore and question some of what I learned. Both of my parents have died, but I'm still very much in a relationship with them that keeps growing and changing. I'm so grateful for everything that they've given me, and I really believe that our love is big enough to hold all the complications. I'm going to start by reading some of the song lyrics just to give you some context for the poem. The Ooh. song mentions balsam flowers, which are used to paint the fingernails. The balsam flowers are also called touch me not because of how their seed capsules explode. So the lyrics, just as my fingernails are stained with the pigment from balsam flowers, my heart is painted with the teachings of my parents. Although the stars in the sky are countable, the teachings of my parents are not. Just as ships that run in the night are guided to safety by the North Star, I am guided by my parents who gave birth to me and watch over me. Tinsagu Nuhana. Touch or touch me not. My fingernails are dead and died. Die or die me not, my parents stain my heart. I paint my nails with the words of my father. Big girl, that's your job. Don't cut your nails at night. No can help, mm -hmm. one for the road. <laughs> I've seen enough, that's why, rough. What makes you happy? Big girl, that's your job. The grave is for the living. No can help, I've seen enough. What makes you happy? Big girl, one for the road. No can help, big girl, I've seen enough. I paint my nails with my mother's words. The pinkies, Lunala. Touch, 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 not. Touch, 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 not. The sweat-stained shoulders of the white mountain. When I was a child, I couldn't touch him. My dad slumped and sighed at my mother's altar. 
His sunburnt neck was the mountain's peak, the next valley his hanging head. I couldn't see beyond the burn to the inside caverns collecting the imminent waterfall's leakage. I paint my nails with the size of my father. Repeatable tides, unrepeatable waves. Past the white mountain, legends tell, Shangri-La-like, of a snowy plain that flowers above an ash heap, your mom. The so-called touch-me-not explodes upon touching. On Wednesday, scientists who count what can't be seen estimated three times as many stars as previously calculated. In songs two, the stars are countable, unlike the lessons of our parents. Every day is someone's birthday or someone is dying. Big girl, your job to tell the tissue, hello, goodbye. When I was 11, my mother was 42 and dead. I calculated 31 more years of living. When I was 22 and she a fixed luminosity, I calculated an equinox, 11 years with her, 11 without. When I was 33, I was still counting. I was 33, my dad was 64 and dead. In a universe of averages, I reckon 53 and dead. Stars explode. If I were hypothetically to count the syllables I have spoken since the day my father died and find the tally odd, I would be forced to repeat everything, everything. So the syllables folded over would be even. And then I would be unable to speak at all. The body's death solves nothing. Responsibilities inked indelibly as body hair, obvious as a nose, are transferable. There's always a toilet leaking, a handle in need of a shake, accounts to pay, mail to sort, weeds to pull, boots to polish, an ancestor waiting to be fed. There is always someone to please your job. I am acting out the daughter part, mother, father, my pole star, please. Some lessons are not meant for living. The daughter believes she will not outlive the mother. She believes in the afterlife of her parents' afflictions. They are haunting her shoulders. Some lessons are meant to die. She can ease the mountain's silent quake. I want to see beneath the stain of their names. Mother, father, this lesson is exploding. I trust, I trust not the parents who gave me this heart. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Janine. Wow. It's a very, it's a very uh, deeply emotional piece you got. Wow. It's very different when I read it on the page. It's like even more like, wow. All right. So I have a question for you. We have time for one question, I think. So Janine, I heard today you gave one famous scholarly uncle huh? uh, who wrote one famous Okinawan book. 
So you can try and talk about him. And I want to know, because that's your uncle, right? Um, was knowing about Okinawan culture really stressed in your household when you was growing up, right? Because that's your famous Okinawan uncle. <laughs> Um, so my uncle is Ronald Nakasone, and he edited this really great book um, that celebrated 100 years of immigration um, and from Okinawa. And, and actually, so I didn't really know him growing up because he lives in California. And so he was kind of like this un faraway uncle who I only saw really like a couple of times. And I remember when I got his book, I think that I was in college and I came home and my grandma had it at her house. And it was so exciting to read this book because, you know, like I come from this family where like, you know, like I would always try to like ask questions. Like I remember asking my grandma all these questions and she just never really wanted to like answer me. <laughs> like I come from a family of like non-talkers. So like, it was really great to finally like read something. Um, and to feel like I, I understood a little bit more, I could kind of like fill in some of fill in some of the gaps, you know, like Ashley talked about, like, you know, when like people don't always want to talk about everything. And that's part of what we, I think, you know, part of what we grapple with and deal with, I think also, especially as writers, like people who love words, <laughs> like we want to know the stories. Um, so, but, you know, I did grow up really feeling like Okinawan. Like I, you know, I mean, it it was always really important to me, like going to the picnics, going to the New Year's party. Um, I, I, it never felt like it was something that that it was separate from from who I am. You know, it always felt like something that was really deeply in my heart and just there, even though no one really talked about it that much. I like that story. So, did you ever get to meet him? To thank him? To tell him? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I I have now seen him more, and and actually, I I did recently see him. He was just here um, for a family event, so I I I have been in in touch with him. But actually, I haven't been able to really talk to him in the way that I think I would have liked to, like when I was like in college and really like seeking answers and trying to find out more. But um. But yeah, I I know that I I have resources in my family and and you know and I have people in my family who I think you know have more stories to share um, and I trust that they will come out <laughs> as they need to come out. Uh, is it possible to grab your uncle's book real fast to show it to the people out there? Yeah. Um. Oh, you know what? I took it to the other <laughs> room because I was actually like just reading it the other day. I had it right here because I, I have my little Okinawan section. I know. Okay section. You're, you're I know. I know. The and then I, I um, <laughs> because I was making this, I like took it to my room. Do you Never want me to run and get you. it? Never mind. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all my planning. All my planning. Okay. Never mind. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank <laughs> okay. Lastly, now. Uh, Brandon Ufugusuku Ng is half Okinawan, half Chinese, 100% dynamite, 2001 Castle grad. In 2009, he got a one-year scholarship from the Okinawan government to get in touch with his Okinawan roots through traditional Ryukyuan performing arts at the Okinawan Prefectural Arts University. He made friends at Plani Uchinanchu from different countries like Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, Canada, and the continental United States. He practices Sanchin and pu pushes for the revitalization of Okinawan language and culture. In 2016, he made an album called Tichi. You can hear that and other stuff on YouTube, other online streaming platforms, or on brandoning.bandcamp.com. So I know you get one song for us, right, Brandon? One special song, my favorite song. Take it away, Brandon. Okay. Um, thank you, Lee. And thank you, everybody, for allowing me to be a part of this. Honored and humbled. Um, yeah, so I assume we'll talk more about it a little bit after after I sing it. But this is on, a song called Shike no Uchinanshu, and um, translates to basically Shimanshu of the world. I'm sorry, uch, Uchinanshu of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Shima Jima Kara Shi 
became clay watata Misa no kurashi hajimati Deji na koto yata Oya fa fuji gachibati kumiso chan Nama wata ya ichi chosa Um, you want me to say anything else about it, Lee? Oh, you got to <laughs> tell the story of how the song oh, came okay, to okay. Well, I thought you were going to ask me. Okay. Um, so, some of you uh, may be aware, but um, so the, the, t- the title of that song, it kind of fits um, with what's going to happen later on this month. Probably, I think, actually later on this week. In Okinawa, there's a, the World Uchinanchu Festival, right? The, the Taikai happening. And um, um, I guess, was it summertime? Well, leading up to summertime, there was a, there's an announcement from um, the festival organizers that they were looking for um, people to submit a theme song or yeah, to submit a song to be considered for the theme song of the Taikai. And I had known from from the previous taikai that you know f- f- it's kind of strange but, but one of the guidelines actually before it was a requirement this time it just became a guideline that that the the song that you submitted should be in japanese language um you know so i because it said should be i thought okay maybe this year a little bit different so i sent them an email and i asked them you know if um if i submit a song if someone submitted a song only in uchinaguchi would it be you know automatically disqualified and they said the response was it no it won't be immediately disqualified <laughs> but um you know we we would like it to be in japanese and their reason um they explained that because there's so many variations of uchinaguchi throughout um the island and then i assume they also meant 
you know, even if you go to the other island groups, there's actually separate languages within what we call Okinawa Pre Prefecture today. I think that's what they're getting at. Um, uh, yeah, so because of that, they would rather have this, you know, Japanese, which they, I guess they would figure more people understand, which might be true. You know, more people probably would understand Japanese and Uchinaguchi in Okinawa, which is also a little bit um, unfortunate. Um, but, you know, I thought, okay, well, it's not going to be immediately disqualified, so I'm going to send in my song anyway, going to finish it up. And then hopefully, you know, even if it doesn't get selected, even if they don't like the song itself, hopefully it'll, you know, open some ears and open some minds. And maybe next time they'll, they'll be more open, you know, to, to using more Uchinaguchi at the Uchinanchu festival. Um, so, yeah, so that's, Great. that was a big reason behind it, yeah. Good job, Brandon. I love the fact mm -hmm. you're such a rebel, bro. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, your background is kind of interesting, right? Because your grandma talks Uchinaguchi and she taught you, right? So I know some people uh, who live in Hawaii, uh, kind of same generation wise like you, but their grandparents, they refused to teach them Uchinaguchi. Mm. They said shame, that's why. Yeah. So try to talk about your grandma and when she came here and why she wanted to teach you. And did you always want to learn? Did she always want to teach you? Yeah, stuff like that. So actually, so my grandma um, and my grandpa on my mom's side, second generation, so born and raised here. Um, and actually, my grandma grew up hearing Uchinaguchi from the elders in her family, in her community. But she, um, so a little bit of a correction, she actually never learned to speak it. She could understand and she can understand, um, you know, pretty much almost any Uchinaguchi spoken to her, except, except really formal language, because people never really talk like that, um, you know, in the house and everything. But... Um, what we did learn from my grandparents is to be really strong about who we are as as Uchinansu um, on that side of the family. So, um, you know, kind of similar to what was said earlier with the, our other panelists, I, I grew up, you know, fortunately knowing about um, Okinawan identity, feeling very strong about it. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I didn't really um, know that much about it. I just knew who we were, but um, it wasn't until I, you know, got much older that I got much more interested in, in the culture itself. And that's actually when I really discovered, okay, there's, there's a, we have a separate language and it's endangered, you know, and, um, um, you know, coming, I, I got the chance to live in Okinawa for a while. So I, I learned um, some stuff there and when I come back home and even now, you know, I, I will throw Okinawan words at my grandma once in a while and, and she'll understand, but again, she'll, she'll mostly answer in, in English. Um, now, every once in a while, she will teach me a new vocabulary that I hadn't heard before. Um, and yeah, so that's always neat when, when that comes up. Because, you know, she's, she's getting older too. So um, I think that kind of helps maybe sometimes for those words to come out as well. Oh, very um, interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that uh, she was a speaker. So now... The, the student has become the master. Good, Brandon. <laughs> All right. So I, I have one more question for you. So okay. I know you're kind of dating both, but if you had to marry either the sanshin or the guitar, yeah, which <laughs> one would it be? Wow. Oh, that to make me choose, huh? Um, that's hard. Um, you know, I think right off the top of my head, I might pick the guitar just because I've had a longer relationship <laughs> with it. Um, <laughs> I guess a longer, um, more, uh, more meaningful relation. Now, I, sh I should take a step back from that because I actually was introduced to Sanshin from my grandpa when I was really young, right? He would, he'd always be practicing when we'd go to their house. I never learned till way later, but um, I was exposed to it way back then. But, you know, at the same time, it just so happened last night, uh, a bunch of our friends, we got together at a friend's house to welcome um, some friends who had recently you know, come here either from Okinawa to study or, um, you know, just kind of, um, yeah, move to Hawaii. And so the Okinawan culture was what connected us at, at this um, gathering last night. And, you know, Sunshines came out and, and it, I hadn't played Sunshine for a while in a, you know, just a, a hang, uh, yeah, just a party kind of setting. And it was, it, it felt, it felt so awesome just to, just to reconnect um, with, with the music and, and the instrument and um yeah so that's that's a hard one i'm just gonna leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh i think we have time for a question or two 
I don't know if anybody wanted to uh, put in the chat. I found the chat over here. I'm looking if you have any questions. If not, we can ask each other if anybody here wanted to ask uh, the group or somebody uh, in particular a question. We have time for maybe one or two. Anybody wanted to ask anybody something? This is our chance. We're a bunch of Okinawan non-talkers, huh? what's up? <laughs> ah. Maybe you could talk about the cover behind you. The cover? Yeah. The artist. The artist? Okay, yeah. so, uh, so this is based on a photograph uh, by Gordon Uehara, and the cover model is uh, Scotty Moriyama. Um, so it's supposed to be in Hawaii, and he's looking off into the distance at the homeland, yes? So he's looking off into the sea to Okinawa. So for the artist's interpretation of the photograph, uh, for the ocean, she kind of made it kind of look like the texture of like a whale shark. I don't know if you noticed that aspect. And uh, oh. in the distance, you can kind of see like a Bingata design in the, the clouds. If you see the bottom of the cover, the sand, the sand design, which you kind of see in, in this screenshot here, uh, it's supposed to be more of like a Hawaii Bingata kind of design. So yeah, it's a very beautiful, very attractive cover. And the back is also cool too, which nobody can see. The back, we got some awesome blurbs, yeah? So wait till you guys see who we got to write us our blurbs. All right, so I guess let's start to wrap it up then. So let's see. I'd like to thank uh, all our readers. Yeah? Thank you, Jeff, Janine, Ashley, Brandon. Yeah, thank you for sharing your manao. And thank you too to all the viewers out there in top the internet land, yeah? Uh, if you joined us late, Today's reading was just one small sample yeah, of all the pieces that, that get inside Chiburu, anthology of Hawaii Okinawa literature that's coming out from Best Press in 2023. Uh, the book was made possible by one generous grant from Hui O Lao Lima. Also gotta thank uh, Joyce Chinin and John Itomura um, for writing nice letters and recommendations. I could get the grant. Yeah, uh, the book stay available for pre-order at bestpress.com. B-E-S-S-P-R-E-S-S dot -E -S -S com. Search Chiburu. Uh, mahalo to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival for having us. Um, Roger's going to say something at, at the end. Be sure to keep an eye out for when we get our big book launch party in early 2023. Um, we have, we're hoping to have one big in-person event. Yeah, uh, Hoping that we can have that so we can see all our, our fellow contributors. And hopefully we're going to have several smaller events too. I shall pass it on to Roger. Well, hello, Lee, and, and the rest of you. That was fascinating. And uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing the whole book. And maybe we'll create a, another event with many more excerpts. Um, uh, I, was, I, I knew very little about Okinawa. Uh, and as we were talking, I actually looked it up and I was astonished by the history and um, just the isolation of Okinawa um, seems very similar to our own here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Similar population, similar population. So I learned a lot and I, I particularly enjoyed these performances. Mahalo. Thank you, Roger. Thank you all the viewers and Readers, uh, I look forward to seeing you guys next year. We're going to all get together. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.